At DoSomething.org, we think young people are awesome, even though they now hate that word. We think they're fantastic, and we run campaigns. We'll run more than two dozen campaigns this year alone, and it's all things that kids care about. Uh, we help them magnify their feelings about things. In fact, we abide by what I call the tater tot principle. Does anybody remember tater tots, the tater tot day in the lunchroom at the cafeteria? That was the best lunch day. <laughs> now, let's be honest, tater tots are basically short and stubby french fries. Um, they're no better for you than the french fry. And there are lots of organizations that want to take away kids' tater tots. We are never going to be that organization. Uh, we fight lots of other battles, and those other battles are things that kids care about. So, for example, top two causes that kids care about, evergreen, always, animals, and homeless. They're basically like gateway drugs for cause. They're starter drugs for cause. If you want to talk to your 10-year-old about cause and get that kid hooked on cause for life, start with animals and homeless. So we'll run a campaign on homelessness. No one seems to know that a third of all young people in America, of, of all homeless in America, are under the age of 18. So we run a campaign around youth homelessness. We call all the homeless shelters in the country and say, when a 17-year-old gets to your shelter, what does he ask for? Does anybody want to like shout out, guess what you think it is? What would you want if you were 17 homeless? A lot of you want internet access, shocker. Tater tots, I like that. I like the way you think. Thank you for listening. Um, it is. It's jeans. It's jeans. It's just like every other person in this audience. It's just like every other kid in America. They want jeans. So we run a campaign called Teens for Jeans. And in about three and a half weeks, we collected over 900,000 pairs of jeans. You can clap. <laughs> and so. And so um, homeless shelters use those genes to lure kids off the streets. Kids have learned about the issue. They've made an impact. Moms are happy because the kids have cleaned out their closets. And the partner that we worked with, Air Postal, is happy because we sent between 300 and 350,000 people into their stores in Q1 when they need foot traffic. Great campaign. Another campaign that we just ran last week um, is called Undocumented for a Day. So it's entirely SMS. It's all built on top of Mobile Commons, who I know is here today. Yes. Um, uh, was that Jed? Anyway, so they're on top of Mobile Commons. And, um, and you simulate by text being undocumented for a day. But you don't know when you start the game. When you start the game, you just think this is the day of your high school graduation, and you miss the bus. Um, the problem is, is you can't drive to school now because you don't have a driver's license. And then your mom offers to take you even though she doesn't have a driver's license, and she gets pulled over by a police officer because she was speeding to get you there on time. The entire thing is an SMS flow, and at the very end, um, if you're upset about how you were treated in this game, you have the opportunity to auto uh, call your senator to talk about the DREAM Act and DREAMers. It's fantastic. Um, it has a 97% open rate text. Um, we looked at churn, at who is most likely to stay on our list, and our top three markets are McAllen, San Antonio, and North Miami Beach. So that means we are skewing Hispanic. Our most engaged users are Hispanic, Asian, and urban. It's fantastic. But there's been this one side effect. Um, I won't say it's not fantastic, but it's been a surprise. So last week when we sent out this game, we get, every week when we do this, a couple dozen texts back from kids having to nothing to do with the cause. So nothing to do with being undocumented or immigration or the DREAM Act. Things like, help, I'm being bullied, and I don't know what to do. Um, texts on eating disorders. And the worst text we ever got said exactly this. He won't stop raping me. It's my dad. He told me not to tell anyone. Are you there? We're not experts in this. Um, we were humbled uh, that someone would turn to us with something so personal and so private, and we were horrified that there was clearly no other place for her to turn to by text, and that she was sort of that lost and that desperate. And so we decided that day to build a text line, a crisis text line. And this is the thing that we think could save as many lives as penicillin. So we're building this. Uh, it will be totally private. Right? Because it's by text. This is a medium that they prefer. Anybody who has a teenager in the room knows this is the only way you communicate with that teenager. It's by text. Um, it'll be private. No one hears you, like when you're calling a hotline. When you text, you could be bullied at school at the lunch table texting for help in that moment. It's fast. 
Um, we're working with the Media Lab at MIT on auto-tagging and natural language processes. So instead of being kept on hold for two hours like a hotline, if we see imminent harm in your text, you get moved up to the queue in the queue much more quickly. Um, this will lead to great collaboration in the not-for-profit sector because we have lots of different groups working together on this, bullying groups, eating disorder groups, um, rape and incest groups, sex trafficking groups, all in one place. And the thing that makes me most excited about this is the data. So thanks to that AI, thanks to that, those natural language processes, in real time, we will have a map. We will have our finger on the pulse of what's going on in every zip code in the United States um, with these crises. Um, uh, we will, you'll be able to look up a zip code and see the relationship between bullying and eating disorders. We'll strip all the personally identifiable information and make this available to the public under a Creative Commons license. And this should inform police departments and how they allocate resources, school boards, um, uh, politicians. You shouldn't have Michelle Bachman no longer, well, we shouldn't have her anyway. You shouldn't have, um, we shouldn't have anyone, you can clap for that too. Um, uh, we shouldn't have anybody no longer sort of just spewing policy based on their own personal convictions. Now we'll actually have informed communities, we'll have fact patterns, we'll have data, we'll have information to be able to make smart decisions, to build things based on data, to reason. Um, you'll have journalists using this, so instead of just being driven by anecdotes, they'll be driven by information. So I've done this talk before, and uh, up until this point, this is public knowledge, um, but I like asked for a stool because this is the part where I sort of get nervous. I um, decided to talk to you today about something related to this because I figured you were sort of a safe audience and I could talk about this. So that text from that girl came to us almost two years ago. Why is it taking us so fucking long to build this thing? It's a really clear, simple thing, crisis text line. As soon as I said it, you all nodded, and those of you who were like tweeting looked up, and you were like, okay, I get it. It's really clear, it's really simple. We have the expertise. We've been working with Mobile Commons for years. Their stuff is like good and set to go. We are, we're building, we're like ready to go and on top of it. Why is it so hard for all of us to make something new? So I've got three thoughts. One is that it's my fault, another is that it's our fault, and the third is that it's their fault. So my fault. Um, and, you know, as he graciously said, I've, I've done startups before, I've done this before, I show up on all those stupid lists of like best and favorite and whatever. I should be good at this, but maybe I suck. Maybe I'm really not good. Maybe it's really hard to go back to a startup after you've had some success. You know, Do Something Now has 45 employees. I have a personal assistant um, who like helps me keep all of this shit in balance. Maybe like I've lost my edge and I'm just not good at this startup thing anymore. I'm totally open to that. I might have just become comfy. And so I'm not good at the early startup thing. Maybe it's our fault and that in the sector we are really, really bad at collaboration. And this is an inherently collaborative entity. Um, we talk a great game about collaboration and how we're going to work with each other. And we name drop the right stuff. I'm a huge fan of Jen at Code for America. I'm like one of her biggest champions. I retweet her all the time. Big fan. I want a jacket, okay? I want one of these jackets. Like, I would wear it. Um, I, uh, I don't think I could be a fellow. I'm apparently not good at the startup thing. So, uh, so we, we talk a great game about each other, but when I need the help and support, when we need the help and support of these bullying organizations and rape and incest organizations and sex trafficking organizations, we fragment because there are zero incentives for us to actually work together. In fact, the financial incentives for us are aligned the other way, that each one of them should be creating their own text line. And so that's what's happening. Several of them saw my TED talk two years ago, and now they're creating their own tech line, tech text line, which is fragmenting the data, and the whole thing rides on velocity, volume, and variety of data. And if we fragment, we won't have that. But there are zero incentives for us to work together. Even though, by the way, we're building this as a white label solution, you can strip the name crisis text line and use it we're, we're for free. The third possibility is that it's their fault. And by their fault, I mean the man. And in our word, the man is the money. I'm talking about traditional foundations. Now, traditional foundations do lots of good things. Um, I, I think Andrew will kill me if I don't mention that, like, this is one of those good things, right? Like, Personal Democracy Forum is, 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 is supported by places like Ford. But 
let's be honest, and what I want to do now is take some of the things that we whisper about to this stage. There are lots of things that traditional foundations are doing to hamper this new disruptive stuff. So one is, and the thing I've been told again and again is, this is a great idea, but you don't fit our buckets. No shit, it's new. <laughs> The second thing is, the second thing is, if I'm willing here to sit here and question and sort of splay my guts out and say, I might not be good at this because I've gotten too comfy, do you really need to sit in that $400 million building Ford Foundation? What, do, are you not comfy? Most of it is not even usable space. So I'm going to quote my sister from a mother, another mister, Sarah Silverman, who once said to the Catholic Church, if you really want to help the poor, how about selling the Vatican? And so one request I have today is Ford Foundation, sell the building. Be like Blue Ridge, move to Brooklyn, be in a loft space, trim your staff. Do you need a cafeteria? New York pizza is awesome. Be in a loft space in Brooklyn and get back to your roots. I think you've gotten comfy. And the third thing is this business model thing which is, I keep getting asked, well, is it sustainable? What's the model for crisis text line? Maybe you should sell the data. No, I'm not selling the data. I'm not going to sell the data to like hedge funds or um, for like certain police departments. It's going to be open. And here's the thing, there are things that governments do because they think that that's what's important and part of the value system for that state or that country. So in some places that's healthcare, it's roads, in some places it's education. There are things that private industry does because they think they can make money on it. And then there's us, and we matter. We are worth funding. And that's what you were set up to do, traditional foundations, so please don't forget it. So. This was not a pitch. Crisis Text Line is fine, and it's launching August 1st. This is a request to all of us to take this conversation and put it in the open. I hope I just started you all talking. Thanks.